So this is just the movie that I tried to show you yesterday. What you're trying to do now with robots in corsets. So uh, you have this robot and you're trying to do extreme sport like skiing in this case. Go, go, go. And the robot keeps following you. The problem is this is just a marketing movie. There's still there are millions of Kickstarter the uh, uh, companies that try to do this. But uh, we hope to have the best one. Then I think that at some point they remove the robot and you just see people doing extreme sports. And still excited. So maybe if I ride by the robot, I can also do these amazing things. We forgot to edit to the commercial. Anyway, let's go to our corsets back. So, yeah, this was the marketing session. And, okay, so today we start to move from the intuition to the, to the ferry. And begin with a simple example. So we have a moving person, in this case it's me, and the GPS data of the person. So what you see here is me moving in Cambridge. This is the three-dimensional signal. So time and then XY. So it's three-dimensional image, and this is just a projection on XY. And we have two problems. This was for the, I, the first problem for the iDiary project. Uh, when I move, even if I go for the same, along the same street, you see there is a noise because of the GPS, for example. Noise or just because of my movement. A more important problem that we'll talk about later is that every time that I go from home to MIT, it looks like a different segment, but all these are actually the same road. Maybe I use different lane, but... So we want to smooth these segments, and then much harder problem to cluster these lines to know that this is the same lane. So this gives the motivation for the following problem, which is kind of generalization of linear regression. So you have endpoints on the dimensional space, actually signal over time. And for each uh, time unit, you have a point in d-dimensional space. In our case, uh, x and y. And you believe that all these points are lying on few segments. And you want to feed these points to k segments. So if you k equal 1, you just want to find a linear regression, the line that minimizes the sum of square distance of the points. But more generally, you want some k piecewise linear function, which means just k segments that will minimize the sum of square distance to the point. So if this is the original point, this is the projection on the k segment. So the cost, the fitting cost, is the distance between the point and its projection. And the overall cost for the, all the points to the suggestion the function you just have the sum of square distance for each point in time t to its projection on the k segments in time t squared. Very natural problem, millions of heuristics over time, but we want some provable result. And again, we want it in a big data model using millions of computers and uh, infinite number of points that come in, a streaming, uh, in the streaming fashion. So uh, for this problem, we want to, def before we define corset, we need to define some kind of query space and input. So the input to our problem is just a signal, e dimensional signal over time. The family of queries that we want to approximate is the con candidate solution. In this case, is every k segment over time, all the possible sets of k segments in RD. And we need the cost function. This is the third thing that we need for defining a, to define a corset. In this case, the cost for a given query is the sum of square distances of the points to the query, to the k segments. So we have a definition, input, query, and output. So now we need to define a cost set. So I suggest, for example, now, uh, for now, the, this definition of cost set. So suppose that one plus epsilon cost set for k segment queries mean that it's a weighted set, so every point in P also have a weight, and it's a subset of P. And for every k segment that you give me, the sum of square distances from the points to the segments will be approximately the, the, will be approximately the same as the cost for the cost of the points. But each point in the cost that have a weight, so it may, represent, it may represent a lot of points. So if you have minus point here, you just replace it by one point with, uh, with weight million. This is the intuition. So for example, if... Uh, Suppose that I give you the input today and the query tomorrow. So you can compute the sum of square distance in all of n time. Just go of each point, compute the distance to the projection after all of n or all of n d time. 
you can compute this cost. And the motivation, for example, is that if I give you the, the input now, but the query only tomorrow, can you preprocess the data so that you can, for every query that I'll give you from the family of queries for every case segment, you can compute this cost in log n time, or sub, sublinear time. So if you have such a compression, then you can do it that when I give you a query, all you need to do is compute the sum of squared weighted distance from the red points to the segments, and we're done, and you know that you have one perception approximation, but it will take you significantly less time. Now, actually, all the courses that we've seen in this class and all the courses that I implement are essentially uh, take a huge amount of time to compute, say, n to the five, and offline, one computer, non-parallel, non-streaming, just math up code, which is exactly the opposite of what I promised you in the big data model that will be on streaming data in parallel and everything. But what I want to uh, show you now, that if you know how to compute such a core set on one computer, then you can solve the original problem on the big data model that I defined, which means streaming and parallel. And I want to show you, and this is true for any core set, under the definition that we'll define soon, but let's see why. So suppose that this is our core set. All you know to do is compress n points to one over epsilon in time n to the five, uh, in one computer. So now I give you now I give you uh, millions of points and ask you for courses for this point. So you take the first set, only uh, two over epsilon, and compress it to one over epsilon. So your algorithm is slow, but since this is such a small set, you can still compute it two to uh, two over epsilon, two over epsilon to the five because n is just equal to two over epsilon. So you compute the first set, but you have again billions of points on the line. Now you take the next set of two over epsilon point, compress it, and you have another one with epsilon coset for this set. Now the problem is that if you continue, eventually you have millions of coset in memory and the memory will explode. So the trick is to take these corsets and take the union of these corsets. So if for every case segment, this corset represents the original data, and this corset represents the original data. It means that if you take the union of these two subsets, for every case segment that you give me, I can just use the union of the two corsets to approximate the, the sum of curl distances from the original point to the case segment. In other words, if we take the union of two corsets, we get another corset. And the approximation error is the same, right? If you had took 3% uh, milk with 3% milk and combined, you still have 3% uh, of uh, fat milk, but just a bit more, double than you have in the beginning. But the approximation will be essentially the same. So, and again, we just took um, one over epsilon here, one over epsilon here, and compressed it, uh, and, and just merged them to two over epsilon points. But then, we can get rid of the original set, and we have only, one over epsilon, only two over epsilon points here. And then we compress this core set again. So we take the union of these two core sets and compute core set for the union. So this is the, before it was the merge step, now it's the reduced step. So we have two over epsilon weighted points from these two sets, and we apply the core set again, and what you get is one plus epsilon core set for the one plus epsilon core set that we have in the original data. So if you give me case segments, and you compute the cost for this new core set now, what will be the error, the approximation error? So what is this core set? What is the error of the new core set? So we took two core sets. Each core set was one plus epsilon approximation for every query. We combined it, we, com we merged them, so we still have one plus epsilon approximation error. But then you compute another core set. So one plus epsilon core set for one plus epsilon core set, what kind of core set did you get? In Eddie? Two. Not two. So one plus epsilon approximation for one plus epsilon approximation is one plus epsilon squared. Right? It's an approximation of approximation. So we have one plus epsilon squared core set, but we have one set of one of epsilon points in memory, and that's all. So now you give me the next set of points from the stream, and you compute core set for this set. And now if you give me case segment and ask, what is the cost for this case segment? We just take the union of these two core sets. 
These courses will approximate the distance from these two sets, and these courses will approximate just the distance of its own uh, set of points. And again, we have another set, compute the corset for it, merge the two, two corsets to get another one plus epsilon of corset for these two sets, compute another corset, and we have one plus epsilon squared corset. The problem is that if you continue in this way, again, we have too many corsets in the second level of the tree. So what do we do? Any guess? Another one, right? We just compute another corset for these two. We just merge these two corsets and delete them from memory. And now we compute one plus epsilon approximation. And we have one plus epsilon to the three corset for all the original data. So, in the worst case, how many corsets we will have in memory? So if you have n points, or n corsets even in the, in the leaves, how many corsets, for, for example, now we have only one corset, but before we have two corsets, also here we have four corsets, or something like this, two corsets. What is the maximum, if we have n in general, this was a just small binary tree. But if we have in the leaves, n leaves, n, n, n original points, how many corsets will have at most in every given moment? Log n. Log n. Why? Excuse me? The depth of the tree log n, so what? Yeah, the, the, the two observations. First, if you have binary tree, the depth is log n. Second, we have its most one corset in each level. Why? Because if you have two corsets, you immediately delete them. So that's why we have just log n corsets. And each, each corset is small, it's log n multiplied by one over epsilon. Another observation is that even if I have n equal uh, billions, I still never run the algorithm, the corset uh, algorithm that I write in MATLAB or Python, on the millions of points. I only run, during all this process, I run the algorithm only, I, the input was 2 over epsilon, the output was 1 over epsilon. The input was 2 over epsilon, the output was 1 over epsilon, and the same is the next level. That's, that's the only routine that I apply. Take a set of, very small set of points and reduce it by half. I, don't, I never need to run for large data sets this algorithm. And this solved the streaming problem. So I can continue this and have only log n set in memory if I saw only n points till now. So a question. Some people ask me, why can't I just, I have a set of points. You give me new points. I just add them to the corset and compress. Then you give me another set. I take the union and compress. Why can't I, I can't just do this? Why do I need this tree? Every time you give me a set, you can just add and compress. Add and compress. We don't really need a tree. Why, why, why still use the tree here? What's the problem with this approach of take the next two points, just merge them and compress? Take the next point or 10 points, merge and compress. Anyone see the problem? Yeah? Uh, your power would grow linearly in the number of... Exactly. So remember here we pay. This was... 1 plus epsilon cost, this was 1 plus epsilon squared, this one 1 plus epsilon to the 3, and if we do it n times, it will be 1 plus epsilon to the n, which is too large, which is 1 plus epsilon n or something huge like this. But if you use this tree, eventually we have 1 plus epsilon to the log n, and how big is this? This is approximately, any guess? One plus it's about, yeah, Two. one plus log n epsilon up to some constant. So, which means that if we just run the algorithm with epsilon over log n instead of epsilon, we still get epsilon approximation. So this is a small number, this log n. So it's very easy to replace epsilon by epsilon over log n and still get a small cause that so when you actually this is for real one when I actually look at the memory of the computer we see that uh, this is how it looks like this is from real uh, for a real run and uh, all these jumps of course are because of the of the way that we construct the uh, the tree so sometimes we add a point and we do nothing 
And sometimes we add a point and we need to update all the log n levels. So this is the size of the input, how many points you inserted to the stream. This is the memory. Just want to write in metal of how much memory I use. And you see a beautiful log function here when I increase more and more points. Uh, there is, now, okay, we talk, we talk about streaming, how about parallel computation? So how can you compute these three in parallel if you have a lot of computers? Any suggestions? It's very easy. Can't hear you? Embarrassing Yeah, embarrassing power. What does it mean? Yeah, I mean, we, we can, this, this course is independent. So the case segment mean, you cannot solve the optimal solution if you just have two sets. You cannot solve the case segment mean here and case segment mean here and, and just combine the solution. But for course that you can do this. So you can compute the courses for this set and this set and this set and this is totally independently. In the same time, simultaneously, then take the union and then compute the next level and then the next level. So in the end of the day, so all the night you run compression for the huge amount of data, and in the morning we just take this small compression and run the heuristic or the algorithm on the small compression. So again, it's totally different from what we used to do. So most of the time we spend on compression the data, and in the morning just use one computer and one metal function to compute the courses for the, to compute the optimal solution on the small courses. So it usually takes just a, a minute when all the night was for, uh, spent for, for compressing the data. Uh, the problem with this approach, and, and it's very easy, by the way, to implement, for example, using Hadoop or Mar MapReduce. So you just say this is one and this is one, this is two and this is two. And then for the mapping, each computer gets, this computer gets the first, the one, this computer gets the, the sets that we've labeled two, and then they reduce the data again. So we just do few iteration in Hadoop, and uh, it's, it's straightforward to implement this using Hadoop. The main problem is that here, we have parallel, but we don't have streaming data, right? So here I assume that you have all the data and just split it into different computers. But before I assume that uh, you have one computer and you get the data on the fly. But what if you have infinite stream and you still want one pass over the data and you still want to use the 10 or 100 computers that we have on, on Amazon Cloud, for example? So. This is a bit harder, but do you have any idea how we can combine the parallel and streaming? So we cannot just take the courses and split them because this, we have infinite courses, infinite number of points, <coughs> and it's just arriving and you still want to use a lot of computers. So we solve the problem for one computer in the streaming. I told you what to do when you get a few set of points, just compress them and enter the tree. But how can you do this if you have 10 computers or two computers? How can you take advantage when they want to divide the time by half? So this is the trick. Um, just if you have two computers, just send the even points, the points with the even index to the, uh, to the second computer and with the odd index to the first computer. So first point go to this. Second point of course go to this computer. Third goes again to this. Fourth goes again to this. Each computer will just compute its own Corset tree. So each computer, we just get a stream of points. This gets a stream of green corsets. This computer will get the stream of pink corsets. Each one will compute the three, three, three independently. In every given moment, when you have corsets for all the points that we see it in now, you just ask for each uh, server or computer to give you uh, the corsets in its tree, and then you take the union, and again, you have corsets for all the data. Um, The main problem is actually we don't have a corset for this problem. So we can easily see, give a, a, an example where every corset that you compute uh, for the set of points for the case segment mean problem uh, must have at least, uh, an, of size, well, must be of size at least n, which is the size of the original data, at least for one example. So for example, assume that this is p, this is the input. And you say that you have a small weighted subset, say n minus two even. I give you n minus two point to choose. You choose n minus two subset, give them weights, and say that for every case segment that I will give you, you have good approximation for the cost, for the sum of square distances. 
So suppose that you take all the points except this point. And I want to prove that you actually don't have a cost set, no matter which way to give to these points. How can we do this? So I want to give a query such that the fact that you didn't take this point will kill you. We'll, we'll prove that you don't have a call set. And again, call set must be good for all the possible queries in our family for every case segment. Any suggestion? How, how a query that will, how the query will make this point extremely sensitive and important for computing the cost function? We just choose a query where the cost of the query is dominated by this point. So if you didn't take this point to your call set and I give you, after you give me the call set, I give you this signal, so what will happen is that the, the, curve, the function that I give you cover all the points except this one, the original cost is more than zero, but no matter what weights you choose for this point, your cost for the call set will be zero, because you don't know about this point which means that no matter how small or large epsilon is, you have a very bad approximation. You want multiplicative approximation, and if you answer zero when the real answer is more than zero, you don't have any constant factor approximation for every constant and non-constant number. So, it's a pity. We have a great idea how to use the call sets in the tree and big data, but we don't have such a call set for the problem. We don't have a weighted subset. But if you look again on the slides, all the tree that you bought, where is this? Yeah. When I tell you all this story about the compression and merge and reduce, I never use the fact that the cost set is a subset or not subset of the input. The question is what is the minimal assumption? What should be the cost of definition so these tricks would work on the cost set? So, so first of all, uh, I will show you why we can have good causes for this problem if we just change the definition. So for example, in this specific set that I showed that there's no cause set, you can trivially just take the first point and the last point, and since the distance is the same for each pair, for every case segment that I give you, you can just run the integral and compute the sum of square distance for the point. In some sense, these two endpoints represent all the signal. If, even if you have millions of points here, we don't care, we just need the two endpoints and you have cost set of zero error. The only problem is that the definition, the way that you use the cost set, you're just, you just take the sum of square distance from these two points, but you run some integral of sum of all the points in between. But these two points represent exactly the original input. And the same if all the data is contained in just a few segments, you can just take the endpoint of these segments and this endpoint represents all the data. And here I just use the fact that the time, the unit time is constant. So when you have two endpoints, you know exactly what happened in between them. And if you have just a case segment, you can have such a compression of two K points and uh, read down. Of course, in practice, the data is not on case segments. So the cost that we were able to construct and I hope to show you in the next days is that if you project all the points on a specific set of K segments, and you choose some representative that are very far from these segments, what you get is actually more points that you have here, because you have N projected points and few one over epsilon points outside. So the size of the cost is actually larger than the original data, it's N plus one over epsilon. But all these N points can be represented by the, by the edge, so all these endpoints will be represented just by two K points. And the trick is for the cost function, you use the cost set to be different than the original cost set. So this is giving intuition why for every paper we need to define a new cost set because we see that previous definition doesn't work and we have a new definition for the very specific problem at hand. And this was just one example. So I tried to write down what are the minimum property that we need for the cost definition. So all this trick for the big data and the stream in parallel uh, would work. And that's why we need the first formal definition. So x in our problem is just Rd. Oh, let me write it here. So this is for the k-segment mean problem. K 
segment queries. So the input, we have points in RD. But in general, X can be a set of chairs, bottle of beers, lines, supported vector machines, whatever you like. And so all I know about X is that it's a set. The next thing, we need a set of queries. What models we're trying to fit for the data? So, uh, Q is just another set. Usually, both of these sets are of uh, infinite size. So this is all the points in RD. This is all the possible K segments. So Q are possible. Uh, K segments, which mean K piece with linear functions. So Q is all the possible, is a set of all possible K segments, but in general, again, it's just another infinite set. And we need a cost function, what exactly we want to approximate. So the cost function, get a subset of the space, in our case, a uh, specific signal, for example. So this is how I denote a subset from X. And you also get a query. And the output is just non-negative number. We want non-negative number because if it will be negative number, it will be very hard to talk about one with epsilon approximations. Strange thing will happen. So we just talk about a uh, positive cost. And now we can define what is the cost for this problem. So we have cost function, queries, and ground set. And we say that uh, uh, so we give an epsilon, which is the error parameter. And we are given some subset that we want to compute costed for. So this is a specific, specific signal in our case. P is the GPS points in this specific case. And what we want is a cost set which mean that for every possible query in the family, so I mean there are infinite number of queries, but still for each of the queries, we want that the cost of oh, let's say it cost C is one plus epsilon of the original cost of the query. So for every query, the cost that you get from the cost that for this query is at most one plus epsilon of the original cost and more than one minus epsilon the original cost. Thank you. Um, another way to write this, sometimes, sometimes, sometimes it's more, more simpler, is to say that the cost PQ minus cost, the cost of the Q, Absolute value is epsilon cost PQ. So this is the same, these two. So if you take the difference, you get epsilon compared to the real value that you want to compute for the original data. Okay, so we have a cost definition, so what now? Now in order to actually apply it for the 
for streaming T for the Merchant reduced tree actually down, right? Yeah, I think down will be the right place. Cool. I can make it. Okay. Right. So now we need a theorem. What can we do with this? So suppose for every P1, P2, So the property that we want is given two core sets, compress them again to a new core set for the same size. That's actually the only property that they use in all these stories and animation that I show you. So for every two sets or core sets actually that we get in the tree, we assume that the size is uh, uh, these are the two nodes. And this is the size of the core set. That's why we need a small core set. I mean, of course, we can return all the endpoints and say this is a core set, but we want that this number, the size of the core set, will be small. So this is the minimum number that you can actually compress the data by half. And suppose that we can do this. Uh, so we can compute, we can compute Uh, corset C. And now we have a definition for the corset. This is the definition for the first slide, for the previous slide. So this is well defined. Uh, the size should be the same because we want to shrink every two. Let's write O of C. We want to shrink every two to another corset of the same size. Uh, and we want to use of S memory actually the first to just use C. Uh, where's the eraser? You have something? Mm -hmm. Be accurate, let's just keep it C. Uh, so we can do this using OS memory, using this is also C, and what's important is the time. So this T might be quite slow, but we don't care. And we assume that this is what you can do in one machine using your Python code, and that's all. Now we have the then. Essentially, what I want to say is that we can have this magical tree, magical uh, imaginary use tree that I show you using this corset. So the data is now streaming, so I said we can maintain, because the data is keep arriving, corset for the for the endpoints. for the endpoints that we got till now. So n is changing. Every time that you get new point, n is increasing. N points seen so far. Uh, and we also want parallel algorithm. So we want to take advantage of n machines. Instead of machines, we can talk about threads. So one machine with several threads is also OK. The insertion point, the insertion time, so it will be just p log n. So we need to update at most log n corset, but each update will take at most of t time. And it's not for one point, it's for m point. This is for endpoints. What will happen? We take the next endpoints, 
we spread it to the M computers and then go to the next M points. So every time that we take the M points and spread it to the M computers, everything will, will be in parallel. So that's why this was the time for one machine, but if you have M machines, we can do this in the same time, we can use, we can take the next M points and then spread them. So that's why the running time will be divided by M if you have more computers. So it's reduced linearly with the number of computers. And regarding the memory that we need, we need, so we have log M coset in memory. So each computer will have N over M points. But so the side of the tree will be log, instead of log n, it will be log n over m. Each coset is of size c. So this is the size of the tree that you will have in each computer. And we might need additional s memory to compute a single coset. So I just add this number. And this is for each machine. Uh, questions so far? Anyone? Good. So the last interesting thing is that actually we can also support deletion. So how can we support deletion? Let's look again on the tree. Oh, it was so far. So we talk about insertion. What happened if suddenly I want to remove a point from here? How can we do this? Update all the tree after I remove a point. So anyone has a suggestion? Guess? So you already learned this trick in the introduction to algorithms. So think about balanced trees. You remember balanced trees when you have to remove a point? So the main observation was that in balanced binary tree, every leaf have only log n parents. When you move a point from here, this coset doesn't care, and this coset doesn't care that you remove a point from this original set of the, for the courses. So all you need to do when you change a point, one of the points from this course to update only the log n parents of this, uh, of, the, of the leaf, and you can do this in poly log n time. The problem is that to update all the leaf, I need to have all the tree in memory, including the deleted courses. So while we can support deletion, for example, if you want just a sliding window so every time you want to add a new, a new point and delete the last point, this could work, but unfortunately the, the time will be good, but we need all the tree in memory. And this is the advantage of Sketch that uh, I hope that we have time to at least mention, that they have other problems. They're not uh, combinatorial objects, but, uh, and they assume that X, for example, is a set of matrices, for example, but you can uh, delete point without uh, using all the memory and remembering all the points. So I leave you, the, the proof is essentially based on the figures that I already showed you, so I expect you to prove it by yourself. If you have problems, please let me know. And I hope it is still true because this was my PhD uh, part of it. And for now on, we don't need to talk about big data or power computation or streaming. This was supposed to convince you that the only thing that you should care about in life is corset. Once you have coset for a small data in Python, and C is a small number, so you have coset that get two over epsilon and return one over epsilon, or take 2,000 points to return 1,000 points. Even if you just few lines in, in MATLAB or Python, you can go to Google and say, I have an algorithm that can take care of billions of points and millions of computers in parallel. Just use this box on all this, uh, on all the computers and together with the imagine reduce tree. And so the next of the lecture, I would just talk about how to construct this corset for classic problem. Yeah. So when you delete a point from a corset, do you just do linear search or how do you represent the corset? In, in this oh, this is quite straightforward. So you have, so you have some points. I didn't uh, draw the point, but so you have some points. This is the original points, and in the figure, I just saw the corset of these points. Okay, so you compress this point to a corset, and then you have another corset here. Now if I delete this point, this corset might be bad, because suddenly maybe other points will be important. So just kill it and compute this again for this set. So you move it, compute a new one, and then you take this corset and this corset, 
Can we do so you just delete all the original codes and just recompute them, but it shouldn't take too much time. More questions? Yes. Oh yeah, so let's see. So what will happen? So when you add a new point to the tree, so if you're lucky, you just have a few points here, you just add them. In the worst case, in the worst case, you might have too many points and then you need to compile core sets. No, then computers came from here. So, so actually, if you give me one point, I just give it to one computer. I, I don't do it in parallel, right? So, so in one point, I don't, I don't do it in parallel. It will take it at the same time. So that's why I just refer it like this. So I said, take the endpoints and send them, and then update the trees in the same time. So you just take a bunch of endpoints, and then I, I couldn't say one point, but then it will be amortized time and blah, 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 but they don't want to confuse you with the amortized time. So I just say for each endpoint you can do this. So of course for, you can have amortized in session time for one point, you can also get the N over M here or something like this. But I saw that this is a bit nicer to, and that's what we do in practice. Uh, so let's start to build corsets. So again, corsets are strongly related to the problem at hand and that's why we have so many corsets and I have so many papers. Uh, so, yeah. So we start with this simple problem, minimum and closing ball. So the input is endpoints. In RD, as usual, like from conventional geometry. The query is a point. And this is analog to the case segment that we had before. And now the cost is what is the farthest point in the input from the query? And of course, the point that will minimize this function is the point that minimizes the sum of this, the maximum distance graphic lines. For example, in the Uh, I guess down right. Ah. Cool. Uh, so, for example, uh, in the problem with the robots, you have n people with smartphones, and each smartphone will contact uh, your server, the quadcopter, or the robots. And you pay the, the maximum distance, the, more, the less satisfied customer. And the question is where to put, what is the optimal query? What is the query that will minimize the, farthest, the distance to the farthest client? But again, when you define the cost, there is no optimization problem. Is that set, there is just a set of all the candidate solutions and the cost function. When you get the cost, you can run your favorite uh, optimization function on this, but the cost will promise you this, and this is important because if the cost will only approximate the optimal solution, there's no such thing as optimal solution. The optimal solution will change over time when you get more and more points. So we don't care about the current optimal solution of the set. We want it to be good for any possible optimal solution in the future. So that's why we need the cost. The cost will be good for every possible query. So if I give you the endpoints today and a query tomorrow. Can you preprocess the data tonight so that when I give you the point, you know what is the farthest point in log n or one of epsilon time without going over all the points and compute all the n distances again, just because I gave you the point already yesterday. So let's start with the case d equal one. So you have points on one dimensional set on, a, on the line, and I give you a query. Tomorrow. So today I give you the point, tomorrow I give you the query. What is the farthest point from this query? Left turn, right? This is the farthest point. Good. 
And if the query was here, what is the farthest point? No. So you have a guess, what is the closest for this problem? Just take the two extreme points, and we don't care actually about all the points. So when I give you the points tonight, just ignore all of them, just take the two end points. And you have a corset, and tomorrow when I give the query, we just look which is the farthest point and give me this distance. Quite easy, right? So we have the first corset. Great. So far PQ will be the, the cost, the distance from, the, from Q to the farthest point in P. This is the cost, essentially, that we defined uh, before. Yeah, so you got this idea. Actually, even if the query is not on the line, and this will be important in a few minutes, the query will be here. The, what will be the farthest point from this query? It will be here. It will still be this point, right? And the same, if the point will be on this half space, this will be the farthest point. So actually, this cost is good even if the query is in RD, not only on the line. We just assume that all the points are on the line. Take advantage of this later. It's less easy in two-dimensional space, right? You cannot use this trick because there is no linear order. So that's what we're going to do. Just choose an arbitrary point and take the farthest point from this point, Z. So this means that the ball, phi this R, where R is this distance between them, will cover all the points, right? So you took a point, you took the farthest point, we call this R, this is the radius, and we build a ball, uh, a ball around them, and now we have a ball that covers all the points, right? Next thing, we construct a square, or a cube in general. So the size, each side will be 2R, because this was R. And we construct a grid. So the size of uh, which cube in this grid, each cell will be epsilon r. So how many squares will we have, how many cells will we have in this grid? Help? How many, how many cells we have only on this side, on this, on this column, how many cells? So this is 2r, right? Every cell is height epsilon r. So how many cells? <coughs> yes, one of epsilon here, one of epsilon here. So we have uh, one of, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, two, uh, two over epsilon, two over epsilon. So it will be eventually all of one over epsilon squared points. In general, all of one over epsilon to the d. Not too much. So now what we do is we take representative from each cell. So if you have millions of points here, they will be represented by the prime point in the core set. And that's it. This is the core set. And again, the idea of using grids and clustering is well known. But we add the additional tricks in the beginning to decide what is the right size of the grid so you can actually prove something about this compression. So the fact that the core set is small straightforward. It's one of epsilon squared, at least when d is small. When d is large, we'll talk about it later, but currently we just d equal 2, so we have a small set of points, so the size of c, which is c here, is just one of epsilon squared, actually independent of n. Even if you have billions of blue points, you still end up with only one of epsilon squared points. Quite interesting, so now we want to prove that this is a core set. So, what we want to claim that for any Q that it will give me, if I look at the cost to P and to C, it will be approximately the same. So the cost is the farthest point from C, which is the farthest red point, and this will be the farthest blue point. I want to claim for every possible Q, it will be at most 1 plus epsilon. Like we promise here. So the cost for every C and Q will be approximated, uh, it will be essentially the same as cost P and Q, or and Q up to 1 plus minus epsilon. So one side is very easy. Okay. So
one direction, the direct, this direction, is straightforward, and actually we don't need this one plus epsilon, it will be only one. Why is this? Because C is a subset of the original point, right? So the farthest point from uh, C to Q will be less than the farthest point of P to Q. If you take less point, the cost will be reduced. The farthest point cannot be larger than the original data. So this side is straightforward. It will be much harder to prove that the cost of P to Q is less than the cost of the subset because this is small and this is large. So why you can do this? So we need to prove that the error is epsilon. This is, again, I use this, this equation here, which is essentially the same. So we want to prove that this time the error that we get is epsilon compared to the real output that we need to give. So why this is small? So far p, the distance between p and q is less than the distance to uh, so we want to know what is the, to bound this distance for the star to this blue point. So by the triangle inequality, this distance is at most the distance from Q to the red point plus the distance between the red point to the blue point. This is triangle inequality. So, but we know that this distance is about epsilon r. Epsilon r squared two, right? The maximum distance between two points if the, in, a, in a square of side lengths epsilon r is about O of epsilon r, or square two epsilon r in two-dimensional space. So we have this, inequal, this inequality, the, the distance for the blue point cannot be too large. And now we want to show why this is small. So every ball that cover uh, these two points, u and z, must be of size at least r, because this is the minimum enclosing ball of these two points. In particular, if this is Q, and this is the farthest point from Q, it means that the ball of this radius cover all the points, because this is the farthest point from Q. So if this ball cover all the points, it also covers Z and U, but every ball that covers Z and U must be of, radi of the uh, diameter at least uh, to R. So we get this bound so we know that r is at most twice, uh, is less than twice this, this number. So we have a bound on r. So the error from the last slide, epsilon r, is actually epsilon than the actual cost. In other, in other words, the, the cell, the size of the cell is small compared to the real value that you want to approximate. So finally, the farthest point from P to Q is less than the triangle inequality the distance from C to Q plus the error between the red and the blue point. But this error is epsilon compared to the real value. And this is the end of the proof. So the error, the difference between PQ and far CQ is epsilon far PQ, which is what we want to prove here. That's it, right? Quite easy. But this is actually a very easy problem. Any question until now? Good. So now we can just, yeah. If I have a fixed epsilon, how does it that my corset size grows if the dimensionality is growing? Uh, good question. So you tell me. So where this, what is the size in this case? It was epsilon one of epsilon squared in two-dimensional space, right? Where did this number come from? This was the size of the grid. So it was 1 over epsilon multiplied by 1 over epsilon. In three-dimensional space, instead of grid, you have a cube. So it will be 1 over epsilon to the 3. In d-dimensional space, 1 over epsilon to the d. Too bad for high-dimensional space, right? So we get rid of the n, but we have a problem with d. Unfortunately, we can prove that this is a lower bound. So for example, I give you some exercise, but if you take all the points on a unit cube, uniformly uh, distributed on a unit cube, then uh, you essentially must take one over epsilon to the d point. Uh, otherwise, I can just put center wherever you miss the place and show you that you don't have a cross set. Uh, 
I'll give you some exercise, and uh, maybe in the last uh, talk I'll give a reference for the uh, solution. But, uh, but the good news is that uh, here we have a very strict demand. We want that for every query, the cost will be approximated. And the question, if you only want to approximate the optimal solution, not every query. So of course the optimal solution keeps changing, but we want the optimal solution of the point that we see still now. Can we do better? And the answer is yes. So this is what we call a weak or weaker core sets, and I'll talk about it probably tomorrow. But for now we have this core set for one point, and this is a linear program. This is a very convex problem. It's, it's not too hard to solve, even a bit slower than this. But the problem is how we solve this for the case. Uh, so actually, before this, I want to show you another trick. Uh, at a minute, yeah, blah, 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 blah. So another corset technique, if you want a corset of size only 1 over epsilon, not 1 over epsilon squared, can we do better? So this is the trick. Take a point U as before, arbitrary point, but don't take the farthest point. Construct a star around U. So the star should have one over epsilon lines with angle about epsilon between each two lines. And now a very classic trick in cost construction. We project the original point, each point to its closest line. So what we get, we still have n points, but now all the n points are lying lying on N, uh, one over epsilon lines. So we reduce the dimensionality of the point in some sense, although we still have n points. But this dimensional reduction, which is, uh, again, classic idea in cost construction, first let's project the point on something and then continue. Even we st we still, although we still have n points, it will be now much easier to construct a cost set because we can just take the union of the end points of the lines. Remember how we construct courses for one point on the line, just the two endpoints? Now we just use it. When we have points on the line, we just compute corset for one point on the line, and we know how to do this, just take the two endpoints. That was the first exercise. So we kind of reduce the two-dimensional problem to a lot of one-dimensional problem. And this is the output. So now we have only one over epsilon or two over epsilon points, not two over epsilon squared. Because we have one over epsilon lines, each line have two where you present the two points in the corset, so 2 over epsilon. So why this corset is good? It's a question, yeah? Does epsilon grow as we get far away from the center? No, no. Epsilon is constant. It's part of the input of all the system. Epsilon and K. Just implicitly, if you get far away from the center, the distance between the points and its projection tends to... I think the next slide will help you to understand what's going on. So why this is a corset? So... So suppose that we project the points, and the projected points, are, we call them P prime, and we have a corset for the projected points, but you can actually prove that P prime is a corset for P. So even if P prime and P have the same size, but P prime is a corset for P and C is a corset for P prime, by definition of this, the corset, the definition that we wrote here, C is a corset for P. Because it's approximation of approximation. So maybe you lose it's two epsilon instead of epsilon, but it's still a corset. So this is also related to the idea that was suggested yesterday, let's compute the corset for a corset. So in general, it doesn't make sense, but if it's different type of corset, sometimes it makes sense. So in our case, P prime is just a projected point, all the red point and the blue point projected, and C is the red point. And we want to prove that C is a corset for P prime. So the red points are corset for the projected points. Why is this? So uh, we consider only one set PI, the original point. And we know that CI is a corset for PI. That's what we proved. This was the first exercise that I gave you. We have points. We can, on a line, we just need the two endpoints, and we have a corset. So now. We take the union of all the corsets, and again, by the property of the corsets, we have that the union of all the corsets is the union of uh, the corset for the union of all the projected points. So C is a corset for P prime, 
And now the question why P prime is equal to for P. So, so we know that we approximated well the projected points, but why is it true that the projected points are a good approximation for the original point? Why are we allowed to do this projection? So let's see what's going on there. So we want to prove that the farthest point from P and P prime is approximately the same for every query Q. So uh, we need to prove this. And we again use the same, we need the same inequality that we, we had to prove before. And suppose that uh, this is the far, Q is the farthest point from P. So Q is the, P is the farthest point from Q. And P prime is the projection of P on P prime. So what can you say about the difference? So again, by the triangle inequality, the error is this distance. <coughs> so the distance between P and Q and the projected point to Q is at most the, this distance. But this distance is just the distance between P and P prime. Now what can you say about the distance between this point and its projection? So the main observation is that since the, this angle is just epsilon, so this distance is just epsilon this distance. OK, this is related to what you say. If the, for, even if the point is very, very far, it will be all, only the, this, this one will be only epsilon to this. So it will be sin alpha, but sin alpha, because alpha is epsilon, sin alpha is also about epsilon. And you have this bound on the distance between the two points. Now why, so we have, we got the epsilon, why this up can be too large? Because this up is less than the farthest point uh, r that we defined before. And again, we use the same property that r is a bound for the farthest point, so we use again this property. And we replace R by the actual cost of the query, and we end up with the, the error that we have is just epsilon compared to the original cost of the query. And again, the other side is essentially the same. Any question till now? Yes. But this all depends on you choosing a center point for this particular cluster. If you choose somewhere outside, then you can project everything onto epsilon uh, angle, and then you will only have two points. Uh, so, so again, I use the main observation here that if you take any point mm -hmm. and the farthest point, you have two approximations to the optimal solution. OK, I proved this in the first slides with the two balls. Just any point, the farthest point, and take a ball. It's maybe not the minimum enclosing ball, but it's more twice the minimum enclosing ball. So this distance cannot be too large, this, this UP that I used there. This is the U, this UP less than R. More questions? Yes. So, from what I understand, basically when you choose your, uh, your center, will um, have repercussions on the compression, on the number? So we'll have different corsets, but the proof should probably remain the same. That's to adjust show. So, so the error is, is that you probably get different call sets, but in, in the end, the proof should work for any, no matter which exact point you choose. Uh, we ha it will be a bit harder unless you will, for the case center problem that we will try to solve in a few minutes. More questions? OK, so one center is, uh, we have cost of one center, but it's really not too hard problem. Much harder problem is K center. The K center, I want to find the minimum K, the K balls of the same radius that cover all the points, not just one. And then everything is much, much complicated because this is a non-convex function. You cannot use all tricks like linear programming. But the nice thing about course is because we don't try to solve the problem, we just reduce the data. Moving for K equal one and K larger than one is sometimes very easy. In particular in this case, so, 
suppose that we take the optimal solution, the k standard, the minimum uh, balls that cover all the points of the same value. So this is the optimal solution. What we can do is we can now compute the grid for each point independently for each cluster. And essentially, we'll have just double the points, so 2 over epsilon or 2 over epsilon squared, but the proof will essentially be the same. So I won't repeat it, but essentially, you can just have a grid around this set of points, a grid around this set of points, and you're done. The problem is that we don't know how to compute the optimal solution very fast, because this is an NP-hard problem. So uh, unlike the k who one case, we just point, take a point, took the farthest point, and we have two approximation. It's less trivial for the case of k center. So in this case, we can use, for example, constant factor approximation, which means that it's not the optimal cost, but it's most twice or 10 compared to the optimal cost. And that's what we already did in the case for the, for the k equal 1 case. We don't really need any proof to have the optimum. We just need that r will be some constant factor approximation. Uh, Sometimes, actually, so we then apply, we compute some constant factor approximation and then apply the grid of different size on each cluster, and the idea and the technique is essentially the same. Uh, for other problem, actually, we cannot have even fast constant factor approximation like k-mean or for support detector machines, so we sometimes use what they call bicriteria approximation. So bicriteria approximation means that not only the cost is constant factor approximation than the optimal solution, but to actually use more than k center. So you still compute with the opt of the k centers, but you instead use, for example, k log n centers. And again, as long as the cost is not too large, instead of 1 over epsilon, we have log n over epsilon uh, points, because we have now 1 over epsilon for each cluster, so we pay something because of, for this log n, but it's not too much, just log n. And sometimes, bicriteria approximation, unlike constant factor approximation, are very easy to compute. Um, and again, after we have the bicriteria approximation, we compute this cluster for each set of points. Uh, but I want to show you something quite surprising. So suppose now you want to implement this cost of construction. So, uh, there's something that uh, we need to uh, be careful about. So uh, I say first a few words about implementation of these kind of costs. So uh, one problem that they had, let's go one slide again. One problem that, for example, when I ask a student to implement these corsets, and I see in one of the blogs in the internet, someone complained why co these corsets are so slow. This was one of the, uh, I think that we couldn't, you couldn't find exactly these corsets in the literature, but of course for case center more complicated. Uh, you can find people complain they're too slow because, for example, what, uh, what people try to do is, for example, for k equal 1, you actually construct the grid. And you just take representative for each cell. And the student complained that it's too slow. So it says, suppose that you just have 20 points and put epsilon large enough so you just did two, two points or something like this. Is it this still too slow? And the answer is yes, it's still too slow. Because why? Because, for example, 1 over epsilon to the d is quite large and it takes a lot of time to compute this. But actually, the running time should never be more than O of n for computing the corset. Why is this? Why? You don't actually need to construct all these billions of cells. So, and this is in general true for all the paper. Never implement algorithm as it's written in the paper. Because in this case, suppose that you have only a few points and you want, uh, again, most of the cells are empty and you want one representative for each cell. How we can compute this cost at enough and time, even if you have billions of cells? Any idea? I mean, do we really need to compute all the cells 
and then throw the points, and then go over all of the non-empty cells, and then compute the representative. Do you have a better idea? Yeah? Excuse me, dictionary? Yeah, just, just to store everything. So what do you mean by dictionary? Like hash table. Exactly. So you can actually you actually don't even need hash table. You can just use the flow function. So suppose that this is one, this is hundred. Okay? And I give you a point which x value is 45.6. You know exactly by using the flow function which, which cell it will be in. So just using log and flow function, you can actually detect the right cell and then store the list of the point that you throw on the grid without actually computing this cell. So this is an example of things that we don't bother to write in the paper and the proofs, but if you actually want to implement it, of course, this is the way that you should do things. Um, other thing you regarding implementation is that uh, after we uh, usually when you actually compute now, if you want to solve the case center on the on the on the core set, you can just run existing heuristic on the core set. You don't need to actually solve the exhaustive using exhaustive search uh, the optimal problem. You can just run heuristic on the core set, and as I already show you, we sometimes get much better result on the core set, and Quite surprisingly, but sometimes we run a true approximation on a 1 plus epsilon core set, which is a bit strange because theoretically the error is 2 plus epsilon. So the epsilon can, doesn't help. You can just use epsilon equal 1. But in practice, don't forget this is just the upper bound on the error. In practice, we get much, much better results. And it makes sense actually to run constant factor approximation on epsilon coset. And we, when, when we decrease the epsilon, we get better and better results over time. Uh, the other observation is that, uh, and we have it for robots. For example, when we, we want to compute, you have only 20 points or 20 robots, 20 people, and you want to find two centers. Can we, what happened uh, if you can try to reduce this 20 point to 10 points? So in practice, we never have epsilon as, as input. So in practice, what we have in the code, you just tell me how much point you want to get back, and that's what I return you. So I, and then you compute the error, and this will be the epsilon. So epsilon is kind of the output, not the input. The input is how much point you want to get back. And I'll do the best that I can. And we don't really use this theory in the, in the algorithm. We just use it for no, for example, what is the dependence of our D? As someone asked here, and you know that when D is larger, we'll probably need more and more points. But in practice, we just compute the grid based on the number of points the user wants, and then compute the cost for this, uh, for this set. Uh, so again, this is very different from the, uh, from the theoretical uh, theorem, and in particular, we sometimes compute 20 points to 10 points, which is from O of 1 to O of 1. It does make sense in theory. In practice, it works great. Because again, the theoretical bound just upper bound, sometimes very pessimistic for any general set. Sometimes we have properties, a nice structure on the set, and we don't need all this. Uh, and the results in practice are much, much better than theoretical guarantees. Uh, anything else? Yeah, there is a strange thing. People send me emails. We use your course set. It will great for our problem. And ask, what is the problem? And they say, I don't know, support a vector machine or some strange problem that has nothing to do with the courses that they use. But it still works great. So intuitively, the idea of, uh, the idea of uh, cluster points that are near each other to one cell makes sense for a lot of application. So I won't be surprised if you take this simple construction, run it for your problem, and you still probably get a very good approximation. Okay, so uh, sometimes we just take merge, merge a lot of courses to get heuristically a good compression of the data and it works quite well. And, uh, Again, we try to use coser that is similar in some sense to our problem, but in practice, you can use the coser for one problem to a totally different problem. Um, another word about implementations. So uh, a good example is, uh, for example, the Chernoff-Hofstinger bound, and say that if you take a random sample of this size, 
you get one plus epsilon approximation with this probability. In practice, we just sample S point. This is the input from the user. We output the approximation and how the error change when you take more and more points. And we don't give epsilon nor delta as the input for the algorithm. We just compute the distribution of the error when you add more and more point. And I already discussed the last point about the implementation. Uh, the next thing I want to do is actually show you that you don't need, if you want cross for k center, you can just uh, download for the internet, for example, the approximation algorithm for k center, which is well known, and then just run it with k over epsilon, or k over epsilon squared, and get a core set. So actually, all we did for uh, till now with the proof was just for the theory, for the theory of proof in practice, I want to show you that all we need is a constant factor approximation for the k center problem, and use k over epsilon instead of k, and you get a core set. And I'll write the proof formally now. Uh, probably, uh, probably need to erase this. So now I want to show that essentially, if you have constant factor approximation for the k-standard problem, you have a core set for the k-standard problem. And actually, we saw this phenomena for a lot of other related problem and core sets. And I will try to write the general theorem for when you can just use constant factor approximation to turn it into core sets. OK. So suppose, OK, try to write very hard. So suppose that we have core set. We just showed that you can have a core set of size k over epsilon to the d for the k-center problem. Why you just can use the optimal solution for the case center and put one over epsilon squared grid for each cluster. And I want to say that if you have, uh, I want to claim that if we just compute the C center, I call it C star of P. So instead of K center, you just compute the K over epsilon to the D center. And I want to claim that this is the core set. So if you want to cause it for the problem and you have good approximation algorithm, just try to run the approximation algorithm with larger input of, uh, of value k of the complexity of your model, and there is a good chance that you can also apply the theorem for your problem. So why is this true? So we know that the cost of the optimal solution, the C center, to Q is less than cost PQ. Why is this true? So one side is trivial again. For every query Q, so now Q is a K point in RD. So why the cost of C star to Q is less than the cost of the older set of points to the query? We already use this trick. Why is this straightforward? So the cost is the farthest point uh, from the original data to the, far, the farthest point from the, from the center. So each point in P go to the nearest center in Q. Why this is less than this? Subset. subset. Again, C star is a subset of P. If you have less point, the farthest point must be 
smaller. And again, of course, this is a subset, not just a small subset, also a subset. So this must be smaller than this. So one side of uh, the definition, of course, that is straightforward. But what about the other side? So now we observe that cost PQ is less than cost PC star plus cost CC star Q. So now I want to bound the other side. Why cost PQ is less than the cost from P to the, the maximum distance between, the closest distance between a point in P to C star plus the cost from C star to Q? This is just the triangular inequality. So this is by the triangular inequality that you already used before, and it's also, also a common tool in cost set. Intuitively, if we have two points that are very close to each other, they should probably be compressed and have one representative in the core set. So we have this property. And we also have this inequality. So cost P C star is less than cost P C. So C is the original core set. Why is this true? So C is the cost set that we have here that we don't know how to construct. It's based on the optimal solution. But uh, this is true because C star is the optimal. C star and C have the same size, but C star is the C center. So for every set of C centers like C, the cost from P to C star will be less than the cost to these C centers. So this inequality is by the property of C star. And now this is by the property of the cost set. So we, show, we already uh, saw that uh, the distance between every point of P to its closest point in C is epsilon compared to the cost of the query itself. So now, if you combine two and three, what we get is the cost PQ is less than epsilon cost PQ plus cost C star in Q. Okay, I just put this one inside this one. And finally, actually not so finally, from four, what we get is y minus epsilon cost PQ is less than the cost of C star to Q. Okay, so we have some bound. It's based on consist RQ. Uh, oh, with the other side, right? Uh, down? Okay. And then the other one up? Yeah, good approximation. OK, so now, without loss of generality, Uh, 
I want to assume that epsilon is less than half. Why can I assume it? Because if you have epsilon, if you have cos for epsilon, then you have cos for any value more than epsilon. This is by the definition of the cos. So if you have cos that would give you error quarter and you want it, it's also give you error less than half. So quarter cos is also half cos and so on. So we can do the other direction, but we can always bound epsilon from above and assume that it's less than uh, this value and uh, this will be good enough. Otherwise, we just assume that the epsilon is, is half. And from this assumption, 1 over 1 plus 2 epsilon equal. So I add to epsilon and you move to epsilon. That's all. It didn't do nothing. But now I can write it like uh, 1 uh, minus uh, 2 epsilon divided by 1 plus 2 epsilon by taking these guys. And this is less than 1 minus 2 epsilon divided by 1 plus uh, half 1 minus 2 epsilon over 1 plus 2 epsilon 1 minus 2 epsilon divided by 1 plus or even 1 and this is less than 1 minus epsilon. And here we use the fact that epsilon is less than half. So we know that 1 over 1 plus epsilon is about 1 minus epsilon. It's also a popular equation in uh, cross of construction. And now we can put it in our equation so we know that cos pq divided by 1 plus 2 epsilon is less than by 6 1 minus epsilon cos pq which by 4 is less than cos C star Q. And now if we take 1 and 7, we get that cost PQ is less than 1 plus 2 epsilon cost C star Q and you also have the other direction by 1. So this is what we wanted to prove. So again, I mainly use here triangle encoder. There are not too many uh, sophisticated theorem in computational geometry, but it's still quite tricky. And in the, rest of the course of the paper, actually, there are very beautiful uh, ideas and observation. But when you actually try to prove things, you get a lot of lists of these kind of equations. Again, not too complicated, but take a lot of space. But don't, don't worry. When you have the intuition, like I tried to give you in the, in the picture, it's not, uh, it's not that bad. But it's good to go over it at least once to get familiar with this uh, trick. The tricks usually repeat themselves in the equations. Um, so in the context of, uh, we talk about maximum distance and uh, we have, unfortunately, we don't have a general framework for maximum distance, but we have a nice general framework for corset construction uh, that I will talk about tomorrow when you want to do sum of distances for some object. And as a warm up, I will talk about the problem of mean queries. In this case, the input is again endpoints in RD. The 
query the point as before, but now we want the sum of square distances to this point. So now the k version of this problem will be the k means, the famous k mean problem. And we want to do uh, similar trick as we do for the k standard to see how we can compress the points. So again, I give you all the points today. Tomorrow I'll give you one query point q. And now you need to tell me what is the sum of square distance to q. Now this is an exercise that you should be able to solve. And it's quite straightforward. Any ideas? Uh, can this is the right direction? Yeah, just put it like this. Is it okay? Or you can slide them both down. Both down? There's really down. Is another one, right? <laughs> At this point, they can't see that many. So. <laughs> Yeah, let's return to back to this one. See, so yeah, you should be able to solve this one. So actually, the cosinus is just of one point. It's not one over epsilon, not epsilon to the d. For any d, for every epsilon, you get the cosinus. And actually, the cosinus is of quality zero. I mean, epsilon equals zero. So you get the exact result using just uh, almost one point. Any ideas? I see some, some heads more. Guesses? Did someone have a guess? What probably would be the good, good solution? So, so what, is, what is the point that minimizes some square distances? You know, as a warm-up, you seem a bit sticky. What is the point? Give you a set of n points, even on a line, OK? So I have a point on a line. The one center is the point in the middle. What is the one mean? What is the point in minimum sum of square distances to the input points? The mean, right? So if we have a street and we have a lot of customers and we want to be close to all the customers, the point in minimum sum of square distances is the mean. By the way, does anyone know what is the point in minimum the sum of distances without the square? Median. Good. You know how to prove it or you just guess? OK, the proof is a bit more tricky. Uh, but uh, let's stick for a moment with the, with the, with the one mean. So, uh, so what is the cost set? This is some people. Yeah, so actually, again, the cost set is strongly related to optimal solution. It was the case for the case center. It's the same case here. There is a strong connection relation between the optimal solution and the cost set. And since we don't want to know the optimal solution, sometimes we just use approximations. But in this case, it's really easy to compute the optimal solution, which is just the mean. But how can you use the mean to answer these queries? Yes? Component-wise mean. Excuse me? Component-wise mean. What's component-wise we'll mean? We just take the first component like, of the vectors and calculate the mean, like the second one. Component. You have a good answer, but they're much more complicated than, than we need. I think it's correct in general, but there's really, really straightforward solution. So let's just try to write down what you're trying to do here. So we want to compute. This sum, right? Sum of square distances of all the points, right? But let's use algebra. Why did you learn algebra so many years? Sum, what is this distance? This is just the norm, p minus q squared, right? Euclidean norm, distance between two points is the Euclidean norm. What now? You can open this. So, on p squared plus on q squared minus 2 p transpose q. Right? Just open it, just simple algebra. But now, have this. I just opened the, this one and have three terms. First one is this. The second one is this. And the last one is this. So 
okay, how can we compute this in all one time? So this is just number independent of Q, so you compute, can you compute it tonight before you see the query. So it's just a number, you compute it once, of n time or n d time, and you have this number. For every query, you, you have this value. What about this? This is just n multiplied by norm Q squared. So when I'm gonna give you Q, you just compute the norm of Q, multiplied by n, and you get this term, all of one time actually, all of D in general. How can we compute this? This value, actually here we have a sum of n, I, uh, n terms, each depend both on P and Q, so how can we get rid of this? So again, use linear algebra. This, we can just put the Q out, Q is not part of the sum. So this is just also the two. So when we do inner product, we can take the Q outside, it's not part of the sum, or if you want, let me put parentheses here. So, and this is actually the sum of the points, which is the mean multiplied by n. So all we need is to save this vector and the number n and the variance, and that's it. So in off one time for every query, you can compute this cost. But again, this is a very, very different cost. It's not the subset of the input. And but you still can compute the cost in all of one time. So for this we, we just do all the equations that was on the board, but uh, now when I give you uh, a query, you need to compute a strange function, but again you have zero error. And again, it's very different cost than the other cost that we saw. So we have cost that is subset of the input, we have the cost that when you project the points on the line, so it wasn't a subset of the input, but it was still a small coset. Now we have cost of one point with additive constant term that you must add to get the right value. So we see very different kind of costs. And we, in the beginning, we also saw costs that when we have actually more points than the original, but we have good representation of the endpoints on the line, so we can uh, uh, save all the, store all the points efficiently. So, so again, this kind of uh, different cost that we have. But again, we try this in the recent year to have more general framework for general properties of a problem. And uh, we'll see some of these examples. Uh, there are some open problem uh, that I want to mention in this context. So we don't understand why heuristics work better on the cost compared to the original data. We already mentioned this problem and it's still a mystery to me. Uh, when I show you this uh, tree, the order of the points is not important. So for a lot of paper or online algorithm, they say we assume that the points are in uniform order or something like this. When I computed this streaming tree, there was no assumption there about the order that you give me the input. But in practice, we see that this is important. For example, if you have all the points here and half of the points here or half of the point here, it matter what order the order you give me. If you give me this set and then this set, or one point from here and one point from here. So, can we say something about what is the optimal order in the stream and can we do something smarter than just take the stream of points in arbitrary order? This is, I think, another very practical problem. Uh, parameter calibration is another issue. So, for example, my students uh, observed that if you, for example, can change the epsilon over time, uh, you can actually bet much more sets. And uh, it's not clear in the tree, so in theory we just compute epsilon cost over time, but sometimes, especially if the cost is very small, you can compute actually epsilon cost with very much larger value of epsilon. So a good idea might to change the value of epsilon during the tree and again get much better costs. We still don't have a theory for this. Again, because most of the results in the theory people, they try to have very general and natural uh, results, but in practice it seems that you can do much better. Uh, if we talk about problem like came in the, the usual problem of how to calibrate not only epsilon but k, usually we just use some greedy uh, parameter estimation, but also in this summer school we saw some, uh, we saw some ideas how maybe we can calibrate the parameters a bit better. 
uh, is also the sketch uh, technique that is kind of competitor to the cost. So in courses, I talk mainly about subset of the input or very small set of points. Um, maybe I once and for all write the definition of a course of a sketch in some sense. Uh, actually, let me use this. So, if you have a matrix A and by D, and you have some random matrix, say log n by n, this is the coset in some sense, then you get a matrix C size only log n by D. So usually F is a matrix that you construct actually before you see any entry of A. This is also very different from cross and cross sets. We compute the cross the base of the input. In sketch matrix, we just take a random matrix under some distribution, for example, Gaussian entries, independent of A, and then we start to get points of A and update this value. And it turns out because this is uh, just multiplication of matrices, it's very easy when I update A, when I add rows to A or just change entries in A, it's very easy if you have S to update this term. In particular, these techniques also help us to change only coordinate of A and delete points by just changing the coordinate to zero, which we can do in core sets. Uh, but it's, this technique also only works for matrices. It's hard to see how we can do this for triangles or chairs, unlike the very combinatorical framework that I defined the, the core set in the previous slides. Uh, there is some belief, some people believe there is, uh, if you have causes for a problem, you can probably have a sketch for a problem. This means a small matrix to compress the data. And so far, it seems true for most of the problem causes that we have sketch. For most of the problems that we have sketch matrices, we also have causes. And it seems that I believe, and also other people believe, that this is some dual space and you can prove some connection between these two uh, communities. I mean, in some sense, every, every row of this matrix is just a linear combination of rows from this matrix. So this is kind of generalization of the mean problem that we saw, that we sum all the points and take the mean. This is a lot of linear combination of the input points. So we take a lot of means of a lot of subsets, and this is the cost sets. Unlike the cost approach, when you take subset in a combinatorial way, for example, a non-uniform sample or random sample based on the input. Um, Another problem is, uh, here I talk about let P be a set of points in one cursor for every possible P. And I show, for example, counter example when all the points are on the line. Uh, but in practice, we usually have a lot of structures in the data. And we don't want cursor for every set under the sun. We just want cursor for our type of problem. So for example, if we know that there is a good clustering in the data, or we have some distribution that the data come from, that maybe we can have much better corset, much smaller corset, or corset for problem that we in general don't have uh, corsets. So this is another uh, great research direction if you're looking for a problem for your master or PhD studies. So uh, can you have corset if you have assumption on the input, especially for important problem when we don't have corsets in general? So if you assume something about the input, can you have better corsets? Um, it's quite amazing that, uh, again, a lot of people talk about dealing with outliers, how many outliers we have in practice, but uh, there's very little uh, problem with provable guarantees and solution of provable guarantee of dealing with outliers. For example, consider this problem. You have, uh, so we agree that the point at minimum sum of square distance is the mean, right? So suppose they give you n points, And I want to find the point at minimum sum of square distance to the original point, but you can ignore the two farthest point or five farthest point. Can you solve the problem now? So of course you can, if I tell you what are the five farthest point from the center, you can just compute the mean of the rest. And actually there are n choose five, which is about n to the five possible tuple of five outliers, and you can check all of them, but it will be a bit too much. So the question, can you do this efficiently? Even for this problem, one mean 
point on the plane, it was open and still, I think, two years ago, uh, with a paper with Lorna Truman, we solved this kind of problem also for line. But uh, for example, for subspaces, this is still an open problem. Supported vector machine, for most of the famous machine learning problems, we still don't know how to solve the problem with outliers. And the, there's a good reason. This is a very non-convex problem. But if you just want to do corsets, and then maybe run heuristic or exhaustive search on the corsets, it seems that this should be possible based on, again, existing results. So this is in another uh, great direction. The last thing that uh, me and my students try to change these days is, again, a unified software library that you can run. Uh, hopefully, also, we hope to do this in Galileo and Raspberry Pi for the Internet of Things. Use all these uh, clouds and algorithms and practice and code, and please keep visiting my website, and I hope very soon to uh, publish a library that you can actually check this kind of uh, authors that's on, uh, on new code, maybe even for different problems. Uh, another question still now? More questions? Okay. So uh, let's define the, the k-median problem. So in the k-median queries, uh, it's essentially the same problem. Now we have two queries, two-point queries. And in the k-median, we want to compute sum of square distances. In the k-median problem, we want to compute sum of distances. So now we have two problems. And we cannot do the trick that we did here, because first of all, it's not sum of squared, it's sum of absolute distances. So you cannot just open this like we did here, the squared norm. We don't know how to open the, the non-squared norm. And you also have this mean here. So even if it was square distances, the mean kill all this approach. So can you have courses for the k-median problem or k-mean problem? And for this kind of problems, we throw a very general framework that is mainly based on the VC dimension and another time called sensitivity. And we show how to solve this problem. In general, the motivation, of course, uh, for example, we show also that uh, this slide, I think it was for the private uh, course at uh, papers, that uh, we want to know how where to put the facilities and uh, we want that the facility will be closed for all the clients, and now we're interested on the minimize the sum of square distances. And again, we want to test several candidates. So for example, the motivation, even for the k equal one case, so we know that the point that uh, Let's return back even for the k equal one case. We have a set of points. And we show, we agree that the point that minimizes sum of square distances is the mean. But what if I want the point that minimizes sum of square distances, but it shouldn't be inside Boston? I have some, some hospital here, some farm here, so you can't put your, your, your store on this area. So now you want the point that minimizes sum of square distances, but you have a constraint. So the surprise is that we can still use the core sets because the core sets guarantee that for every Q, the cost of the point to the query is approximate by the cost of the core set to the query. So not only I'll erase this. So not only the optimal solution is preserved. So not only by this property we have that the optimal solution for the core set to the query is less than 1 plus epsilon the minimum solution for the original data. But we also have the query that if you have the, the property that if we allow to use only a subset of the queries, so we want the optimal query from a subset, for example, because you have restricted zones, then 
just chain Q to Q prime, and this still holds. So if you have optimization problem under strange constraint, like the optimal solution, the solution must pass through uh, specific lines and be, uh, be very far from a specific area, we can still use the same corset approach. Of course, we need some algorithm to solve this optimization problem. But then again, the set is so small, so maybe you can just use exhaustive search and run the heuristics in enough time. So how can you compute in general k epsilon median corset? So uh, again, the idea as I saw in the clustering case, just compute a representative for each set of points in space. So for every cluster, take a point. The main disadvantage of this technique, as someone already pointed out, it's exponentially the dimension. When you go more and more dimension, uh, we have exponential uh, number of cells. So after the first paper appeared, we kind of, I think the first paper was by Kachen, it showed how to compute cost for k-min and k-min on high dimensional space. And instead of using this cluster and grid, we just find a distribution over the space and sample point according to this distribution. So try to give you some hints how it works. So in general, we still have weights for each, for each cluster, but the cluster won't be grids as we had before. And in this case, we say that C is a k epsilon cost for P. If for every set of k stars, k points, the sum of distance from the point of P to Q is one with epsilon approximated by the sum of weighted distances. So again, you bring me k stars, you want the sum of distances, you can approximate this just by taking the weighted sum of distances from the red points. And in general, what we'll see tomorrow is that we can have causes for any kind of problem if you want to uh, minimize sum of distances when distance can be a very general function. So in general, as before, we assume that P and Q are two sets. We have distance function now for every point in a query, not all the set, just a point. And then, then what we want is to approximate this sum of distance to a query. So then all we need is to sample point, but in non-uniform version, in non-uniform way, according to this distribution. So this is the probability to choose a specific point from the call set. The probability says essentially how important is this point compared to the other point. So for example, when you have millions of points here and one point here, why this point is important in some sense to the call set? It is important because if I give you the query here, this point dominate the cost. If you won't take this point, all these are zero essentially. If you won't take this point to the call set, you won't have good approximation. On the other side, all these points for the query are actually have neglected cost, so you can ignore them. So based on this intuition, the definition of sensitivity is for a specific point P is take the worst case query, take the query where this point contribute or dominate the cost. So compared to the, all the, the general cost for all the points, the contribution of this point is maximized. This defines how important this point. And we hope, of course, this number is less than one, because we have value divided by sum of values. But we hope that the sum of all the points is not n. It's something like log n, because this determines the sum of the cost. And intuitively, if all the points are important, we need a cost of size n. But we hope that in general to prove that no matter what set you give me, very few point, set of points are important. And in general, we prove that we can have cost sets where the size of the cost set is the sum of the sensitivities of all the points. Multiply by one of epsilon squared. This is where you pay for the error here. There's no epsilon. Only now you put the epsilon. And we need a number number, not just the sum of sensitivity. We also want to know that the queries are not too complicated. And for this, we use the visit dimension of the query set. So uh, I don't have too much time to talk about it, but tomorrow we'll try to prove this theorem and have some more intuition. How can you compute courses for problem like k-mean, uh, k-median, and other version? Uh, 
using just non-uniform random sampling, both on distance, based on distance sensitivity, and we also answer the question how we can actually compute this sensitivity, which sometimes can be a very hard problem to solve for each point. And I think that we're running out of time, so it's a good point uh, to stop. Any uh, questions are welcomed, and I'll also be here in the next hours. More questions? Okay, well, thank you very much for your patience.